Because I meet a lot of women today who say, I am really angry about the sexism in our culture. And I look those ladies in the face and I say, I'm right with you. For a man to look down on a woman as inferior is sick. Is Christianity inherently sexist? We're going to be watching a video from Ask Cliff where a college student asks this exact question. Bailey and I come from a history of many years of campus ministry. So answering these kinds of questions, just like Cliff is doing on campus live, um, it's a huge part of where we came from and what's close to our heart. So let's jump in. Um, so I have some friends where we talk about like, how they believe that women shouldn't be preachers or women shouldn't be able to talk about God yep. and how it talks about that in the Bible or yep. maybe not that specifically. Right. And then other friends who are just like, why would someone say that? Like, why would someone want to like put women behind men? So yep. I just want to hear like your thoughts on that and you bet. what you think. Well, Phoebe was trained by Paul, right? She was tremendously close. Paul raised her up as a leader who was preaching to men. Then you have an ancient manuscript where one Roman emperor wrote to another talking about how we have been persecuting and we have been slashing and doing things probably similar to waterboarding to this disciple of Christ who was a woman and disciple referencing her as a leader. So women in leadership Absolutely. Now, to the point of, were they specifically pastors? Well, the word pastor is not in the Bible. People, people don't believe me when I say that. Look up and try and find the word pastor in the Bible. It's not. We're both pastors, so sometimes we wonder what in the world are we doing being pastors. It's not in the Bible. Now, women, though, in that Roman Empire, they were considered dirt. So were children. The typical male in the Roman Empire was allowed to have one sex slave, one wife, as well as another mistress and treat them however he wanted to. No woman can go and say, hey, I'm part of the Me Too movement, for example. It was Christians that came along and said, no, we have to find a way to do away with this. We have to find a way to uplift women and say all are created in the image of God. That's when the Roman Empire started to change and the majority of the early church and the church today is by far and away female. That's a great issue you're raising. Why? Because I meet a lot of women today who say, I am really angry about the sexism in our culture. And I look those ladies in the face and I say, I'm right with you. For a man to look down on a woman as inferior is sick. But the question is, why is woman valuable? And here's the answer that I get from too many of my feminist friends. Woman is valuable because she's just like a man. That's a pathetic reason that woman is valuable. I hope, ladies, you don't think you're valuable because you're just like men. Because now you're still begging the question, why are men and women valuable? And I can promise you a woman is not valuable because she's just like a guy. No, false. The Bible gives us the basis for the value of every man, every woman, every transgender, every LGBTQ, every racist, every ethnic heritage person in the world. And the basis is God created every single one of us in his image. What do you think that man stood for? Exactly what I just said. Dr. Martin Luther King understood. All human beings are created in the image of God. That is why racism is wrong. Because racism is saying, I'm inferior, I'm superior, and you are inferior. And that is a lie. That is arrogance, it's demeaning a person. God created every single human being in his likeness, in his image. Which means we all have equal value and dignity. You take God out of the picture, and I'll tell you why a woman's valuable. Because our culture says, if your body's proportioned correctly, you're a babe. You're valuable. What a crock. Our culture says, man, if you've been in a weight room a lot and you're buff, you're a stud. You're somebody significant. That's a lie. Our culture says, if you've got a 4.0 GPA, whoa, you're somebody. That's a lie. 
I've got a sister with, who's mentally challenged. I got a brother who transplants kidneys at Duke University Hospital in North Carolina. I can promise you, my brother, who's a transplant surgeon, is not more valuable than my sister, who's at a third grade educational level at the age of 59. And if anybody goes to my brother and says, whoa, you know, you're really valuable, and your sister, who's mentally challenged, is a loser, my brother intellectually will bust the dude's chops. Why? Because you got to think. Why are any of us valuable? If there is no God, none of us are valuable innately. We just give ourselves value, or our culture gives us value, if we happen to be a winner instead of a loser. Guys, think. You've got to think this stuff through. No God, you're an accident, I'm an accident. If there is a God who created you in his image, you and I both have intrinsic innate value it's that simple first off i actually really enjoy the way that he takes this because yeah. what's interesting is in the beginning whenever cliff's son i think that's his son uh, I think so. takes the approach of well the bible or the christian worldview is actually the thing that brought value to women in our society to, yeah. to begin with. And then Cliff later on goes and talks about, well, what brings, what makes people valuable in general at all? And the Bible is there being a God at all. And the Bible being the God, uh, God being the God of the Bible and how it says everyone is created equal, created in the image of God, men and women, any race, it's the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. It's saying you being made in the image of God is the reason you're valuable to begin with. When And then that's how you're able to say that's wrong to treat that person that way because that, person's in, in, uh, that person has innate value given by God by being made in his image. And so the, I guess the last thing I would say in this monologue is the basis for the civil rights movement was this very thing. And personally, yep. I've personally went to the Lincoln Memorial and read etched in stone right next to this huge statue of Abraham Lincoln, his uh, address after the, the, the Civil War. And yeah. um, where he says, every man is created equal because is created equal. Yeah. Because he's the image of God. Yeah. He's made in the image of God. And, uh, and, and that's why, um, we have all the freedoms that we have in the U S today. In the so. U S. Yeah. I've been hooked on this guy. His name is Tom Holland. He's not a believer. He doesn't claim to be a Christian. He's not Spider-Man. And he's also not Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. He is, um, he is a historian, not an actor, but I have sensed with him and a lot of other prominent people kind of waking up to that truth that. Hey, if you want to chunk out the Bible, you are going to chunk out the only foundation that you are standing on. You want you want women's rights? Well, you can't throw out the Bible because the Bible gave us women's rights. You want uh, civil rights? You know, for for different races, you can't throw out the Bible because the Bible gave us civil mm -hmm. rights. Um, and and I can see it in this intelligent class of people, this waking up to that fact. Whoa, 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 whoa! The Bible. We need the Bible. The Bible gave us all these things to begin with. And such a funny deal for people to criticize the Bible when historically, it is a fact historically that the Bible gave us all those things. Yeah. Um, so so do you maybe, uh, I mean, if there's anything else about this specific video that you want to address and what he was saying, um, you can. But w would you want to maybe dive in further to uh, some of the reasons why people would say the Bible is sexist. And what would you what would you say to that person? If I if if a college student came up to you, how would how would you answer this question if a college student came up to you oh. and said the Bible is sexist because it says that you're supposed to rule over women? Yeah. How would you respond to that? I imagine it would be maybe a little different than if Cliff I'm, did. If I'm if I'm on the street like Cliff, you know, I I don't know that I could do much better than him. <laughs> But if you're going to click on a podcast and just listen to me lay it all out for you, you know, 
um, then then I can take my time <laughs> and, and d- get a little digger, dig a little deeper into it. Get a little digger. Yeah. Um, the I I heard I read it, I was reading an article and somebody said it this way. They said status is not the same as leadership. Status is not the same as leadership. So the role of a leader is is like the organizer, the decision maker. Um, I, I recently accepted a job as a pastor, and it's funny. Nothing is different about me. Nothing is nothing has changed. Um, it's just that I've been given this role as the leader. And there will be times like recently, it was it was pouring down rain, and people looked at me and they said like, um, "What do we should, do? Yeah, what do we do?" And I'm. I'm like, what are you asking me? I don't, know. I don't know what to do any more than you know what to do. Um, but the point is that that's the that's the role of a leader. It's not that I'm better than anybody else, and it's certainly not that I'm necessarily more qualified than anybody else, even though there are qualifications for this yeah. role of a leader in Scripture. Well, you would have been just as qualified before. As some other people yeah, in exactly. that room, and, yeah, yeah. and just as qualified as some other people in that room, and just as qualified as I was before I got you know, the role. hands laid on me and, and, and accepted this role. But the thing is that somebody in the room has to be the decision maker and that's just somebody's job. And it doesn't make you better than anybody else. It's just that somebody has to have the job of a decision maker. Um, and if you believe, to, and if you believe it makes you better than someone else, you're actually opposing the biblical narrative and what exactly. it says. And you start to be come corrupted you you fall from that responsibility and you see it time and time again and that's a lot of times what people point at they're like well this pastor messed up this pastor messed up this pastor messed up yeah and a lot of times it was they started believing they were more valuable than other people when you start believing that leadership is status is when you screw up Mm. but leadership is not the same as status the bible goes like this Everybody's on the same playing field. Everybody in the church is on the same playing field, but everybody's got different jobs. Yeah. And some of those jobs are cleaning up. Some of those jobs are administration. Some of those jobs are miracles. Yeah. And some of those jobs are leadership, casting vision, organizing people, getting everybody on the same page and making decisions. That's just a job. It's not, it has nothing to do with your inherent value um, in that church body. And what's interesting about the biblical narrative, it even takes it a step further not only is role not a status thing, but it actually says that it lowers your status to be higher in role in some way. That's right. Where it's the greatest of you will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Yes, exactly. It's, it's this idea. It's really a heart posture and position of when I'm placed in a role of leadership, I ought to start to treat the role as if I am under other people. Maybe not actually inherently my value is any different, but I start to take the humble route of coming under people. And that is the key of effective, great leadership is, is it's when you start to, you don't have to see yourself as actually less valuable, but you treat other people as if they're more valuable than you. Yes. I, the time to start being humble and being a servant leader is not after you become a leader. The idea is you look for the person who is the most servant-hearted and you pick that guy to be the leader of the group. Um, I, I, I don't remember where I heard this, but somebody said probably nine out of 10 people would say, oh, I could be the president. Yeah, I, I've got some good ideas. I know what's up. I could be the president. I can handle it. I'm good enough to rule over these people. How's your and, memory? <laughs> Probably one out of 10 people would say, no, I really don't think I could do it. I'm probably not smart enough. I would need a lot of help. And what this person was saying is, that's the guy you pick. Right. That is that, And that exactly is the thing that qualifies you. When you say, I need other people to help me do this insanely hard job, you that's when you're actually the qualified All right. one. So take that a step further into to finishing your point of what, yes. what you're trying to say is you're saying value or um, status and role are two different things or yes. maybe is status value 
Is that, mm-hmm. is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, okay. ta- that's what I'm so talking about. So value and role are two different things. How does that pertain to men being more valuable than women or women being more valuable than men or people being equal according to the Bible? Exactly. The Bible does say that men, um, that the roles of leadership in the family and in the church and in these different spheres of life um, should be male ideally is male and and especially in the church should be male um, in political places and and even in like spiritual places there there are women preachers in the Bible and all and and servants and leadership roles within the church but the leadership role of the elder and the pastor is male and in the home leadership is male but to say that leadership is male does not mean that status is male that men are more valuable than women mm-hmm. or that men, um, because there's something better about them. And I've, and I've heard guys try to defend the Bible and say, well, you know, men are more level-headed, and that's why men should be leaders. Or men, there is something inherent in men that makes them qualified for this leadership role. And I think that's bogus. Hmm. I think it's just that God said, men, that's your job, and women, this is your job. And there's nothing hmm. inherent in men and women that makes them they are different. They are inherently mm. different, but there's nothing in their differences that makes men more qualified for leadership because then you get it into a status thing. And it's mm. the same thing like... Are you sure about that? Like, I think I would disagree with that. Please, go ahead. Just because, like, from my experience, what I've seen is that men and women have different, you could say, optimizations. I definitely think that. You know. I, I know that men and women are different. But you're saying that doesn't inherently make any type of man better than any type of woman at a leadership or... You could find a man who is less decisive right. and find a woman who is more decisive. There's, you know, there's this Venn diagram and there's women who are more, who are more leadership oriented than mm. any given man. You pick a man and a woman off the street and generally, you know, the man might be have these qualities that we would associate with leadership and the women would not. But you could find women who are more qualified, but that's not the point. Right. If you get a woman in a family, you know what I mean? If you have a man and a woman who are married, if the woman is more qualified to lead in these leadership qualities, that whatever it, it is, oh. that does not make her, well, you're more qualified now because of these inherent qualities that you Let's have. Go ahead. You be the leader. It's mm. not about status. It's not about value. Mm. value. It's not about what you are or what Mm. you can do what you can perform and that's even what cliff is saying in this clip is that the world or society today are saying well men or women can do all the same things i can perform the same tasks that a man can perform that's not the point right the point and so and and i would i would do it like this um god said aaron is going to be the high priest aaron and his family are going to be the high priest well what was wrong with Korah? hmm famously there's a famous story where their cousin Korah is really mad that Aaron got picked and he said I'm just as good as you I'm just as holy as you and God literally opens up the earth and it says they went alive into hell because they complained about this and but the point is not well Aaron was more qualified and Korah was a jerk the point is God picks the leader but Mm. leader does not mean status Korah's problem is he wanted the status of leader and Moses and Aaron's point is, hey, being the leader does not mean that we have we are more valuable than you. It's just it's just what God picked for and, us. And just to clarify, Korah is not a woman. No, yeah, he's a guy. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. two men that yeah, are two in this men. predicament. And and one man wants the status associated with leadership, and Moses and Aaron realize, hey, bro, this is not about status. That makes me think of Cain and Abel, too. It's like one, the heart behind the offering to God made all of the difference. And I think that's what I see a lot of the times. It's like many times when people are asking this question, there's also usually a deeper heart thing behind it where there's a distrust in men or you've been hurt by men or, um, or uh, I would say even from the flip side, right. a fear in man of getting my status taken away. Right. Boy, if women can be in leadership, then I don't get to be in leadership. And, yeah. and both people think that leadership is status and it's not. Yeah. Or leadership is value and it's not. That we pick the most valuable, most qualified, most charismatic, most visionary person to be the leader. And he's the best one among us. No. Jesus said it's exactly the opposite. 
I'm not picking the leaders out of the best one among you. I'm picking the leader out of the most servant hearted among you. Yeah. And I've seen the, the, the men and women who don't necessarily get caught up on the status or the hierarchy thing. And they understand, yeah, like women are incredibly valuable. Like you're married. I'm engaged right now. And what I've begun to understand during this engagement period is how much value my fiance brings to my perspective on things. Cause I, you know, I'm pretty visionary. I'm going to go after something. I'm going to, you know, create something. I'm going to bring something to this world. Like that is in my heart and mind. I want to create. Um, and, and she does a really good job at seeing the things that I don't see. And, you know, in Genesis where it talks about the Azer, that, uh, that word that, often gets translated into helpmate is actually seemingly according to Bible project and different definitions more accurately should be translated to saving ally or companion that, that kind of a savior because the other times in the Bible where this was used was when God comes and intervenes to save Israel or to save someone. Mm -hmm. And and so that's something her and I have really clung to is like, you are my saving ally. There are aspects where I'm going to run off a cliff if you're not right there next to me yeah. watching my back. Like, and there's this understanding of this dynamic where, where she, is, she loves that I want to uh, step into the responsibility of leadership, but she's understood that what this uh, humble position is of the saving ally, which honestly is not, <laughs> it's not a bad, it's not framed as bad in the Bible. It's framed as super yeah. amazing. And so that's yeah. kind of like where society goes wrong is they look at, oh, well, you're a stay at home wife, you taking care of the kids as not valuable. But then you see that the, falling apart of the family unit is the foundation of our society and what's causing societal collapse right now is that families aren't together and family isn't valued and yeah. people feel orphaned and they're trying to find their value in other things and without those two people and this is turning into a marriage episode but like without the, t the, the man and the woman in their respective roles, understanding that they're value, valuable inherently and teaching their kids that. You see a lot of things go wrong and you get lots of interesting discourse on college campuses. <laughs> I, in my new role as a pastor, my wife and I have had the opportunity to do some marriage counseling and talking to other couples and then thinking about how our marriage has grown one of the one of the number one things that has come out is um, you have to be a team. You have to be a team. You are locked in this thing together. And and I've said this over and over and over again. But four words that could destroy any relationship. It's so easy. Um, my toddler could say them. None of the words are more than four letters long. And it's so easy to destroy any relationship. Four simple words. Mm. I don't need you. Boom, your relationship is done. You want to tear apart an organization, you want to tear apart a church, you want to tear apart two nation, you want to tear apart a nation, you want to tear apart two nations, you want to tear apart a marriage. Mm. Super easy. I don't need you. And you will wreck a home. You will wreck a nation. You will wreck an organization. You'll wreck your company. I don't need you. And when leadership is about status, you say, I don't need you over me. I don't need you under me. I could do this all myself. But when everybody is equal, you realize I need you. I need my wife. And gratefully, my wife says, and I need you. And that is why this teamwork thing works. And when a church says that to each other, or a, or a wife or a, or a family says that to each other, when they say, I need you, you will bind it together in an mm. unbreakable bond because you recognize each other's value. You bring something to the table and then they say to you, and you bring something to the table that I need. 
and that bond that is created is inseparable. Mm. Um, there's this whole question, and people swing back and forth and back and forth, which is, um, why are things the same, and why are things different? You go, why do all dogs have four legs and sharp teeth and a tail that wags? Well, why are, why is a Chihuahua different than a Great Pyrenees? <laughs> Why are things the same and why are things different? And mm. um, believe it or not, this actually is a, is a real deep question in philosophy of why do things turn out the same and why do things turn out different? And, re- and people have taken different sides. Well, things are more the same than they are different and things are more different than they are the same and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And even in our, um, you go, people are fundamentally different. Yeah. And then you get racism, slavery, all the way out to Nazism, you know, you get sexism to sex trafficking all the way out to full on misogyny, you know, all that stuff. Or you can go the other way where you go, people are fundamentally the same. And, Mm. but then you get like transgenderism and well, I can just say I'm a man or I can just say I'm a woman all of a sudden. And because basically they're the same and homosexuality and it's all the same. Nothing's ever different, but the Bible says both. God created mankind in his image, male and female. He created, he created them, them. Yeah. in his image. So the image of God is all of mankind at once, the same, but it's also male and female. But one individually cannot express the full image of God yeah. alone. Yeah. Mankind, man and woman need to be together to express the image of God. So it's this yeah. beautiful image of like mankind. They are the same. But male and female, he created them. Yeah. There's this unity and distinction that is beautiful and critical to the Bible. If you if you say, well, they're just mankind, they're all the same, you mm. lose something of the picture that God was trying yeah. to communicate. And then if you do that, well, it's just men and it's just women, and one is more valuable than the other, you also lose the picture God is trying to create. Mm. Um, in the same way, it says... Um, in Genesis chapter, that's Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter two says the same thing in a different, in a, in a, in a much more vibrant picture of Adam is alone. And it's, and God says, man, it is not good that he is alone. And so he puts him to sleep and he says, he splits him in half, sp- splits him in half. He <laughs> says he takes his side. Yeah. So often you know, gets translated to real. Yeah. Because it is on your side, but that's just what it says. It's his side. Yeah. And out of one half of him, he builds a new human. And yeah. then reintroduces them together, and it, so seriously, and it calls like, that good, yeah, because like, they called it wasn't it. good for it to just be one person, one kind. And then when they when they are reintroduced, Adam says, "This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh," and they became one flesh. Hmm. So God took one flesh, split it in two, just brought to, them back together into one flesh. That's and so that question of why are things the same? Why are things different? The Bible has both, and you can't lose either one or you'll go crazy. Yeah, and anyone in really godly marriages will tell you how there's almost nothing more incredible and and lovely in this world than being unified in one flesh with someone. And then you take it a step further from that, knowing then you produce a new being. And then they'll tell you even a step further, you won't understand love. Like you can never understand how much I love my daughter, or my son, you know? And, and, and so it, and bringing it kind of back to the value of women in the original question is when you remove, okay, fine. Say the Bible is sexist. I don't want to listen to it, but that now leaves it up to you to come up with a better definition of why men and women are valuable. Yeah. And so what you see happening is those breaking down of everything afterwards. Um, And kind of like what you're saying, you start to see this breaking down in the family unit and the dynamics and society and, and all these things. But I think this all ultimately comes back to that. If you take away the image of God. The image of God is the great equalizer. It is the thing that allows you to say sexism, sexism is wrong. Yep. It's the thing that allows you to say women and men are both 
equally valuable even though they're different yeah 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 but then it gives a reason for the beauty of the differences and it actually re-emphasizes the value in the roles that society says is not important Mm -hmm. go be like a man woman yeah because that's actually what's valuable that you lead and you're in the role but the bible says no without this role everything collapses everything falls apart exactly um this is now far off topic but i think it's still the principle that shapes this whole conversation um if i have to fight for my right to party <laughs> or to or to sit at the table in this marriage or to sit at the table in the boardroom in the conference room mm. if i have to fight for it um man's a dog eat dog world out there uh uh famously the the line for evolution goes nature is red in tooth and claw everything is about scratching winning survival of the fittest Mm. and you have to be stronger and better and faster and smarter than everybody else and you have to prove it um but the bible way is always that you receive and you are grateful for the hand that you're dealt because it comes from a wise loving generous father yeah is what the Bible says. But the wise, loving, generous source, the giver, the sovereign of all things has given me something that's good and not bad, and I receive it with gratitude. But if I have to earn it, if it's inherent in me and it's my job to go get it, um, man, then then you really do get a red and tooth and claw world. You get a, yeah. a, a vicious, nasty, um, violent world. Yeah. And... And we are headed that way mm. if we don't return to remembering to be grateful for what we have received yeah. um, and that God's way is, is good. It's not bad. It's not meant to punish me. And um, yeah. it's not a statement of my value. To be asked to serve is not a statement of my value. Yeah, The king himself came to serve. Yeah, So it cannot be a statement of my value. So to wrap this on a bow, I think we can definitively say that the Bible is not sexist, but it's actually quite the contrary to sexist. It is the thing that allows you to say sexism is wrong. And so, I don't know if you want to leave it at that, add something else. That's it. (laughs) Yeah. You want to pray for us? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's, Lord, we want to learn to be grateful. We want to learn to be grateful and and to step into the life that you have built for us and planned for us um, and trust you that it's good. And we know that you promised rest. So we ask for everyone listening for whatever role in life that they've been given by you, that they would find rest in it, that they would find peace uh, when they learn to thank you and, and serve you to the best of their ability. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, thank you for making it to the end of this episode. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to our channel. And if you want to give to the podcast, you can give at divinecreative.org, and that link will be in the bio and on our channel.